Hey everybody, welcome to A Mighty Blaze. I'm Jenna Plum, one of the co-founders of The Blaze. And today I'm here with one of my favorite, I'm seriously gonna cry already. <laughs> here with one of my favorite people and authors in the whole world, Anna Blazer, Julie Gersten Black. Julie, welcome to The Blaze on this side of the camera. Thank you, Jenna. It's fun already and it's surreal to be here this way. I did not have to prep for this interview. I just got to show up as the talent. I know. Isn't that a great thing about being an author? You don't have to actually do the tech. Somebody else will do it for you. And you can answer all the questions about your beautiful new book. And you know all the answers because you wrote the book. So, so okay. We're here today to talk about Daughters of Nantucket, or as we call it behind the scene, Daughters with 14 Zs, Daughters of Nantucket. And a little background, I'm going to read Julie's official bio, but first I should actually do a little Blaze official business. If you are new to the Blaze, welcome. We are a team of 35 creative professional volunteers dedicated to connecting writers and readers in the age of COVID and now well beyond. If you like what you see here, give us a like, follow on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram now. We are ubiquitous. Please sign up for our newsletter at www.mightyblaze.com so you'll never have literary FOMO ever again. No more FOMO. Nobody likes that. And hi, Anissa. Now hi, we know Anissa. you have started because Anissa is here bringing the joy. See what I did there. Hello. Hi, mm -hmm. everybody. All right. So, and also we have only... Um, two subscribers on YouTube away from 1,000, our, our tech Margaret has told us, our tech wizard. So y'all should all sign up for this on YouTube because um, because we're awesome there. Hi, Ellen and Margaret. I see you guys are both here too. We are so happy. All right, this is gonna, this interview is gonna be 14 hours because I'm so excited. So like, let's get this party started a little bit. So Julie um, is the author of that. Is okay, it's okay. I have to say, like Kristen wig out this whole time, you guys. She also holds a doctorate in curriculum and instruction from Teachers College, Columbia University. Her essays have appeared in the Huffington Post and Cognoscenti, among others. Julie is a college essay coach, as well as a producer and host for Mighty Blaze. You may have seen her on Lit Chick with Jenna Payone, and you, other times you will never see her because she's behind the scenes making this magic happen. She's the best producer ever. Mm -hmm. um, and she is a native New Yorker and now lives in coastal, I was going to say Long Island, Rhode <laughs> Island, with her family and one very smart Shisha. Shisha. I, I, Shisha. Poo. Shisha. <laughs> poo. Why did you make me say that? Yeah. Everybody's yeah. been asking. That's the question I get the most from my bio. What is a Shishan Poo? I was like, it's a Bishan Shih Tzu Poodle mix. She's very little. She's hypoallergenic because I'm allergic to everything and she's very smart. So. Yeah, I would like to see Sammy. We would like to see her. And it's better than calling her a Shih Tzu. So Shishan yeah. Shih Tzu Shishan Poo. So thank you very much. And a few words about Daughters of Nantucket. It's Julie's debut novel. And it's a Barnes and Noble most anticipated pick for March. Is it be Owen's most anticipated for 2023? Book club list of most anticipated historical. Things. So basically, if you have an anticipator in your body, you are anticipating this book and now it's out. So enjoy. The starred book list review said, okay, this also behind the scenes made me weep, like hopelessly. Kirsten Platt's beautiful historical novel is an engrossing and emotional 19th century tale, a distinctive, wait for it, triumph in storytelling that celebrates the courage and tenacity of women. Hi, Sharon. And I have to say, I know this because the behind the scenes is that Julie um, is part of the Mighty Blaze crew that grew out of my writing workshop at Grub Street Writers. And so it seems like yesterday that we were sitting around in like 2020 and 2019 talking about the women in this novel and Mariah Mitchell and Nantucket and making pirate noises and um, saying really profane things about fireballs and like talking about um, Titanic and Nantucket. And now this beautiful book is out in the world and I have loved it since I read page one. Um, and now I get to read page one in print. And so I am sure that you will all love it as much as I do. So Julie, longest welcome ever, but welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It is really surreal. I think um, I was the first one to go in that workshop in the fall of 2019. I brought the first 100 pages along to that class. And um, 
and the fact that we are all still together and celebrating this together um, three and a half years later or whatever it is, um, is crazy to me through COVID and beyond, as yeah. you said. That is how we roll here at The Blaze, mm -hmm. but also this particular cocktail of writers, the workshop that Julie was in, the first night it happened, and it's like all of the Blazers pretty much were in this workshop. The first night that um, I taught it, I went down the hall for a bio break. And when I came back, the room was shaking with noise because everybody was like so excited about to be together, but also mm -hmm. about the books that they're writing and the characters. And I stood outside in the hall and, and videoed it. And I was like, this is a cocktail of writers. Um, and it is true that all of us reading Julie's book were like, oh my God, this is so fantastic. Mark is here, our thoughtful bro. The first hundred were so good. The next couple hundred match. Let's go. Let's talk about Daughters of Nantucket. Bring that scrimshaw. Bring that hoop skirt action. Bring that fireball action. Can you tell your audience who has not yet read it what Daughters of Nantucket is about? Sure. Um, so it's set around Nantucket's Great Fire of 1846, and it's about three diverse women whose lives intersect in the days leading up to that event and immediately following. It covers about a two-week period um, in July of 1846. And then, holy bleep, and then, it's a conflagration. I have been describing Daughters of Nantucket for years, for the three years, as being like... Real Housewives of Nantucket meets Titanic in 1846, except with fire instead of water as the disaster. Like, what is not to like there, people? Do you agree with this description and why or why not? Okay, so I do in a way because actually um, we had Rebecca Mackay on last week and she was talking about how she actually began her new novel with with plot, with this mystery at the as the engine. And I began my novel with the fire as the heartbeat of this, you know, of this whole structure. And once I had the fire, I then built these characters around it that we could care about before, like with this looming disaster in the background. So in that way, it is like Titanic. What you know about Titanic is that it's a disaster. You know, what you know about, I made Zoe, my daughter, watch Titanic, The Perfect Storm, like Backdraft, all these movies where the central, it's leading towards a central, you know, pivotal, climactic, horrendous event. And there's built in like dramatic irony there because we know as readers that it's coming, the characters don't, it sets up tension right away. And then um, I populated it with people that you grow to care about and certainly um, want to survive this event. What a smart thing to do. I'm sitting here thinking, what a great formula, like take disaster first and then fill in the people and make them real people which these, these three women are, and I'd like to talk about them, but I'm gonna veer off my own script here and talk a little bit about disaster first, because I love a good disaster book, a good disaster movie. Like I'm obsessed with Titanic. We quoted all the lines in class. Um, and in fact, we would start Julie's workshops by saying, are you ready to go back to Nantucket? Like, so, you know, like I memorized the whole movie, but also like the Poseidon adventure, which I hope mm -hmm. you made so yeah. we've watched like my fave, right? Yeah. Anything that has to do with the Donner party, you know, like any sort of like cataclysmic, great Chicago fire, like whatever. Why are we so interested in disaster? Hmm. I think one thing that's interesting about it is that you know you're not in it. So there's this sort of vicarious thrill of safety from whether you're watching it at home or in a movie theater or opening a book. You escape your life and you get swept into something really dramatic and high stakes that you know isn't going to hurt you. It might move you. And I feel like people do, you know, engage with art to feel something mm -hmm. and to be taken away from their life, but also be reminded of the most important things in your life. And that's what I hope this book does is, you know, reminds us, what would, what would you take in a fire? What are the most important things in your world? Um, and are they those material things and, and those little decisions that you get so bogged down with or, or are there bigger issues? That is a great point of view. When I was a little girl and I was obsessed with tornadoes, I used to play this game that was if you had only 
a minute to get out of the house, what would you take to take to the basement with you? So it's that same kind of mm-hmm. instinct of like, what can I save here and how can I do it? How can I escape this disaster? What would you take? What did your own book teach you about what you would take? So if I had to take, I would take, I would take Sammy. I would make sure she made it out safe, safely because she isn't capable of doing that on her own. Um, I would make sure, you know, my family was out. And if I took a physical thing, it actually would be my Nantucket basket. Um, I, I got it as a gift from my aunt, um, from my bat mitzvah in 1983. It is now an antique. It's a one of a kind piece and it was made for me and has my name in it. And now with this book, it has so much, um, you know, extra meaning to me and it links me to a place that I love. And the people that I love. My my mother has a Nantucket basket. My aunt, my grandmother. We bought my daughter one when she was born too. So there feels like family legacy, and that we are all daughters of Nantucket in my family. Oh, I love that! Stop it! Stop making me cry! Stop! It's so funny because we have been friends for years. Like we were friends even before mm-hmm. that class, and and yet I did not know the lineage of the basket in your family or the symbol. Do you have it with you? I should have asked you this before. I we- don't have it with me. I am wearing a golden basket though, um, and I should, I have it in like another room, but we don't really want me getting up and going to find it, but. You can watch if you if you follow me on Instagram. I did a whole video, like a a sixty second video of my basket, where I hold it up, I open it up, I talk about it for a minute, and this has a little heart on a on a chain dangling from the open basket. Last night, Kimberly wore her basket, mm-hmm. and uh, my mom wore hers as well. So, and Margaret wants to know if the baskets make an appearance in the novel. But I also have to ask if Mark wore his basket because Mark, our thoughtful bro, is very fascinated with the Nantucket basket mm. in a sort of prurient way. Yeah. Um, no, no baskets for Mark. Um, but there are about, ba- there is the mention in the first page of um, walking through town of women, you know, shopping with baskets on their arms. They wouldn't have been these light ship baskets. Um, but the idea that women shopped with woven baskets instead of, um, you know, reusable stop and shop bags. <laughs> it's kind of like the same thing as the reusable stop and shop bag, except totally not. So I'm gonna I'm gonna land on basket a little bit longer because not everybody knows what a Nantucket basket is. And they're not just like regular baskets, y'all. Like for those of us who have Midwestern roots, um, there are like Amish baskets or these hand woven baskets from like different regions of the country. I know in South Carolina, they have them too from like the rushes and reeds. But can you explain a little bit about why this is important? Like what what even is a Nantucket basket? Sure. So it's actually called the Nantucket light ship basket. A light ship, if you don't know what that is, is a um, like in the harbor instead of a lighthouse that's on a rock or on a edge of land, a light ship is sending that ship with light out into the harbor as a warning to people not to come too close to, you know, a a shallow shoal or or rocky terrain. And so if you were, um, and they were all men, if you were a man sitting on a light ship out in the harbor for months and years on time, doing nothing, not even moving on that boat, You needed a hobby. So that hobby was making a basket, Um, weaving them. And then um, they have tops on them and they're, it's like a rattan woven work of art. And that's where the Nantucket light ship basket came from. People carving them, making them, not carving, weaving them on Nantucket light ship, uh, the one Nantucket light ship. And the men did it. Yeah. Yeah, men. men. This is fascinating. So do men and women still both make them or is it? I think it's an art. Mine was made by a man, Michael Caine. Um, There's also Jose Reyes was one of the first to make. make Excuse me. (laughs) I'm so sorry. No, you're totally fine. I know Julie has had back to back to back to back events. And this happens to me all the time. When I'm doing events, you start coughing. Go, 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 go. I will talk instead. Um, while while Julia's getting some water, I think I should bring Trisha on a little bit. Actually, Trisha, do you want to tell? Um, can you like put yourself on? Should I put you on? Hi. Okay. So you guys will know Trisha as another blazer and author. Her book Herrick Sand is out in T 
T minus two weeks and not counting. But while Julie is like getting her throat soothed, can you tell us <laughs> about her launch last night at Wellesley? Yes, it was awesome. There were 50, 60 people there. And there were people like knitting and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. That's what we um, and this woman raised her hand and said, I just want to tell you both, meaning Julie and Whitney, who was interviewing her, Whitney Scherer, that you are both so charming and you should have a TV show. And I am enjoying this interview so much. And um, Julie made me cry three times by all the wonderful things she said. <laughs> and she had us all in tears. It was a wonderful event at Wellesley Books. And they might still have some signed copies if anybody wants to check. They do. Thank you, Trisha. I'm so sorry. I just like. <laughs> no, no, no. Take your time. I know this is like, and, and Julie's, this is her first book. And I should have said like, okay, keep honey lozenges with you all the time while you're doing your speaking. Cause it does. And she got her basket too. To to and your basket. And can I, before we do basket, Trisha, do you have, Trisha was also in our magic workshop um, yes. as an author. And um, do you, do you have any comment about like the process of seeing this book out in the world after workshopping? And it's just like, I, I have no words. It's, it's such a wonderful experience. I, I was telling someone last night, Chuck, who's also in our, our group. I said, when any one of us has a success, you feel like we all have the success because we all like had a hand in it in a small way. I mean, obviously she did the bulk of the work, but you know, we all, you know, maybe changed a line here or there or had a suggestion that made it better. You just, you, you feel a weird ownership over all of them and everybody was just so great and supportive and constructive. It was great. Yeah. I do feel like the class made this book happen. Even if I had the idea and I brought it to the class, it was like what you guys, what you all did to help me see it more clearly that got it to be published. Right. I love this class so much. I love you guys so much. Okay, I'm going to stop. Thank you, Trisha. Thank you for Yay. coming on. I was so excited. Congratulations. About Thank you. your book. We're watching you. Oh, wait. Give us a, oh, never mind. She's off now, but we'll do that at the end. I'll, I'll make her come back on and talk about it. Okay. Basket pivot. Okay. This is the Nantucket Lightship Basket, people. I feel they're, like home shopping network now. For they Nantucket. can be right. They're round or oval, um, and they're made around... Um, a bait, a, like there's like a thing and then you weave around it and then you take that thing out. And then my name in purple, Scrimshaw. That's so cool. What? Ivory. I didn't um, purple was my favorite color. And as you can see, it worked out well with my book because <laughs> purple is still one of my favorite colors and whether we can argue whether it's purple or blue. And then a 1983 penny on the bottom to authenticate the year in which it was made. Um, and then it's signed by Michael Caine. So your question was, um, men or women making baskets? I believe, it, you know, I know it began as a craft for men and many of the more famous weavers at the time and through the early 2000s, maybe, were men. The, and women, the art that women were doing would be the scrimshaw and the beautiful carved. My mom has like a, a nature scene on hers um, that was done by Sarah Chase. For those of you out there who know the land of scrimshanders, um, then <laughs> you might know Sarah Chase. And um, now though, um, there are weavers who are taking the basket art and making things like bracelets and smaller and more like usable clutches and other kinds of um, woven art, like my friend Bridget Wyatrowski from Whale Tail Weaving, and I love the bracelet I have from her. She was like the weaver in residence at Hadwin House last summer. So it's still it's still a beautiful art and it is alive and well. Amazing. We should get Caroline Levitt, our other co-founder, some little basket earrings, which she would love. And also Mark and Joe Moldover, it's not too late for you guys to start weaving baskets. <laughs> You might want to get on that a little bit. Blaze boys weave. Let's just make that a hashtag. Okay. So I did like, I love the sort of real housewives aspect and like home shopping network aspect of this book. And you know, if HSN had been around in 1846, like Eliza and well, actually Eliza would probably be the only one watching it out of your three uh, sure. protagonists. But can you tell us about the three women and how, how they're like, who are they? How are they alike? And then how are they very different? 
Sure. So Eliza is a whaling captain's wife. She's kind of what you may think about, but who may first come to mind if I say Nantucket woman, 1846. Um, and what is interesting about the women um, who were married to whalers is that they hardly ever saw their husbands. You could be married for 20 or 25 years, and the physical time you spend together could be less than three or four years of that entire period because the men were out at sea hunting whales, um, decimating populations. So they had to keep going farther and farther away to find those whales, making journeys up to four years, coming back, being there for a few months, and then going back out again. Um, so Eliza is one of those wives left behind. She's lonely. She's a little desperate because she is financially strapped because her husband is not home. And we they really said, you get paid when your ship comes in. So without the ship, there isn't money. And she's living off of credit. And she's been doing it for a long time. And um, when we meet her, that's that's where she is in her life. She gets a letter from Henry saying he's not coming home as expected this summer. And um, we move from there. The second character, I wanted somebody then, if she's the conventional, what you think of from Nantucket, married, um, whaling, wealthy, children, conventional home life, I wanted something to counterbalance that. And I naturally came across Mariah Mitchell. She is perhaps the most famous female um, from Nantucket. She was the first female librarian in America, and that was on Nantucket at the Athenaeum. And she brought speakers like Ralph Waldo Emerson to Nantucket and Frederick Douglass. He spoke on Nantucket the first time he spoke to a mixed race crowd, black and whites together, was in the Athenaeum um, with Mariah Mitchell there. Um, she is also a scientist and she discovered a comet and she taught at Vassar later and has an observatory in her name, both there and on Nantucket. So she's a scientist, she's well-educated and she's single. She never married and never had children. So she's sort of the opposite, the working girl, um, so to speak. And then the third character is Meg. And she is, once I started reading about Nantucket, I realized there was an entire thriving black community living parallel to their white counterparts on the island. Um, and so Meg represents a lot of the traits of one of those daughters of a black whale and captain who was incredibly successful and came back with status and money like many of his male counterparts, but still they could not achieve equality on the island. And she's fighting for her daughter to be able to have what she never did, which is an equal education. Um, she, I have her being denied access to high school, even though she passed the entrance exam. And now she's fighting for her daughter, who's eight, and she's pregnant. And she and her husband are business owners trying to open a, um, their shop on Main Street. Thank you. That was so concise, and they're such complicated and nuanced women. You can hear how different these women are um, demographically, even though they all live on the same tiny island, and then their lives intersect in this very pressured way during the fire. So I would love to talk about the fire a little bit and how, because you said you started the book by thinking about the fire. How did you find out about it and what sort of wiggled your ear about it being like, oh, this is maybe the, the book that I want to write. And can you tell us a little bit about the fire? Because I love to hear about the fire. Yeah, since you just met Trisha and she came on, I will tell you that at one point I said, oh, I can't get to the fire. I keep writing and writing and writing and I can't get there and I want to write the fire. And she's like, so write the fire, like make it, leave a gap, like skip over whatever you haven't done and write the fire. And that might actually inform what you do earlier. And so I did that, which was the best advice. And because I had started with that in mind, but I knew it wasn't the first thing to happen. So I kept trying to write to it and it kept moving farther away. Um, so that was, um, those hundred pages that I wrote about the fire are pretty much the same as they are today. That's the least amount of editing that I did. Um, and 
I first learned about the fire from Nathaniel Philbrick's history of Nantucket. It's called A Way Offshore. Mm -hmm. And like on page 11, there are two paragraphs about the fire in the entire history of Nantucket. And I wanted more. And I was surprised and upset with myself that I didn't know this piece of history since I've been going to the island for so many years. And um, so I went into the local bookstore, Mitchell's, and said, what do you got on the fire? And they said, nothing. <laughs> um, and then I went, Mitchell's, there are two bookstores, they're co-owned. And I went to the other bookstore and they did have one copy of um, a self-published history of the fire by VB Gowdy. And I read it, loved it, and was hooked. And that's that was it. That's where the fire and he he did he compiled a perfect timeline of where everybody was, all first person accounts. He read newspapers, he went to town hall, he did all the research that I did not want to have to do. And then I could create around it. Nice. Yes. I remember like the experience of reading the book, which you will find out, you guys, if you haven't already, is that you know the fire is coming, just like when you're watching Titanic, you know that the disaster is coming, but you're so involved in the women's stories that you kind of forget, but don't forget. Um, and then when you get there, it's this kind of, a kind of experience of wanting it to, to come on because you're like, oh my God, you know, I, this is like the whole point of the book in some ways, but at the same time, you don't want it to happen because you really have fallen in love with these women um, and don't want to see them harmed in any way. So um, fireball. There are fireballs, though, oh y'all. Oh, you want to hear that? Tell us about the fireballs. I remember reading the first scene when the fire actually starts, and just being like, "Oh God!" You know, like to read yeah. the end. But then there are fireballs, which I kind of love. Yeah. So one thing I learned from the history of the fire was that there were two people on scene when the fire broke out. But the people themselves were lost to history. We don't know who they are. We just know two people first reported the fire in town on a certain night, a certain time. Mm -hmm. So I took that and I was like, oh, one of them is going to be one of my characters. And why is she out so late at night? And what is she doing? Where is she coming from? And where is she going? Um, so I put her there. And then as the fire spreads and people move around town, um, the, th the thing that was crazy and I don't think it's really a spoiler to tell you that the fire did spread at one point, like sort of a vortex of air and wind picked up this fire and just flew it over that way, two blocks in a direction that it was not um, anticipated to go. It causes, you know, it just mayhem here, there, everywhere. And Nantucket at the time, it was hayloft. You know what a hayloft is? It's like what you would want to set a bonfire with. All the buildings are made of wood. Everything inside is kindling. Um, sail lofts and kegs of oil in the harbor. So you can see the dramatic possibilities of what could happen there. Yes, and now you can read them also in Daughters of Nantucket. That's true because it was a whaling center. Um, basically like there are these giant cauldrons of whale oil everywhere just waiting to go boom and then they do go boom and then you find out what happens to the ladies to Eliza, Meg and Mariah so oh my god and so I'm like sitting here like kind of like rubbing my hands just thinking about it with like anxiety but also like it's just such a great book you guys I have about two million more questions but we have a lot of audience questions coming in as well so I'm just going to ask a couple of like very they're the questions that I always want to know when I talk to an author, and especially of historical fiction. The research that you did for this um, obviously had to be a heavy lift, although hopefully enjoyable. What was the thing that most surprised you? And then what was the thing that most surprised you that you couldn't put in the book because it just didn't fit the story? Um, yeah, it required a lot of research and that I had only written contemporary novels up until this point and they did not sell. I was able to get an agent and the agent was always excited about the project, but then they just were not hitting in the market in a way that was sort of doing something different. Um, so this, I was reluctant because of what I thought was a, going to be a ton of research. And my agent at the time said, see you in three to five years. Bye. And she's no longer my agent, and I did it in two years. So, so there. Um, but 
it was reading through everything and then figuring out you have to kind of in historical fiction read it all and then forget it to write the story mm -hmm. um and I have a background, as you said in my bio, I have a doctorate in education. I spent 10 years doing research for that degree. So once I was realized that I'm, I'm not afraid of a little research, so I could do that. So what did I learn? I think it really was about the thriving black community. I had no idea um, that this, that they, they existed in such um, a prominent way and that there's this really great ancestry there, as well as the fact that they um, were going through at very much the same time as the fire, the issue of segregation. Um, they desegregated the schools for a year and then segregated them again. And then finally, um, you know, desegregated officially and finally in 1847. So once I saw that and realized, well, there's lots of kinds of fires. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's metaphorical, there's, you know, desire is a fire. Um, racism is a fire. And then we actually have this real one. So I put them all together once I saw that history. Okay. And then something that I couldn't put in the book that was interesting. And I told this story last night. Um, People communicated through letters and sometimes letters got lost and sometimes they crossed and took years to get information. And so a man went missing at sea. He was presumed dead. His wife um, mourned him and was a widow for several years and then remarried. And then the man came back. Boom. <laughs> He was fine. Yeah, what happened? Like all the letters got lost and, you know, he thought he was communicating and they never got word. And I, I don't really know what happened after that. Though. Oh, my God. That, that could be a sequel. I know oh, that yeah. you're considering writing a Nantucket trilogy, right? Is that still a thing on the horizon? Yes. See what I did there? That metaphor. Very nice. Nothing yes, else. that is a thing. I have a, I have three books planned. They're standalone novels, but they relate to one another and they relate to Nantucket. The second one picks up five years after this ends. And so I do have a little bit of an open ending and you will find out, you'll get to visit those characters at the beginning of the second novel. Um, and if you didn't read the, you know, in order, it doesn't matter. But um, what I had to do and you know this because you were there. I had to kill a darling, which is a term for getting rid of somebody or something in the story that you really love, but isn't necessary and isn't serving the book anymore. Mm -hmm. So I had two friends for Eliza mm -hmm. and I gave, every, and one was not a point of view character and the other was Mariah who was. So I took this other character out of the book and gave all the friendship qualities to Mariah instead. and. Now there is one sentence in the book that says, Nell Starbuck, who was, Mar was Eliza's best friend, is circumnavigating the globe with her merchant husband, Peter. So the second book is Nell Starbuck packing for a journey with Peter and their daughter, Winifred, and a global shopping spree on a clipper ship. Okay, what about that does anybody not like? Like you had me at global shopping spree. So fantastic, but also, again, there's a sort of winning combination of that luxury or like the sort of lusciousness of, of one element of the book and then peril, right? So in this book, we get the women's lives, which would be interesting even if you didn't have the great fire because Nantucket is such an abolitionist seat and it's kind of like the Isle of Sappho's with the men being gone, like you have a really, um, mixed demographic population because people keep coming in from other countries and then staying there. Like it's a fascinating place. And then holy bleep, as you said, in one of your notes to us in workshop, there's this big fire. And I feel like the second book is the same way where you're like, I get to travel around the world with these characters shopping in the 1800s and seeing these fantastic markets and so on. But you're going on a ship. You're going on a wooden ship. Mm -hmm. What could go wrong? So again, I think this is like your your really winning formula here that I intend to try and, and steal, um, yeah, completely organically. Okay, so we have a million audience questions, and I would I have many of my own still, but let's let's appease the readers and viewers, please. Thank you so much for joining us, you guys. 
Um, what have we got, Tricia? Let's let's pop up one of our first questions. I'm going to read these out for people who are listening. Ellen, one of our other Blazers, our Twitter queen, says, are you writing full time? If so, how do you structure your day? And if not, what is your day job and how do you squeeze in time to write? Great question, especially for a touring writer, because then like everything is off the table, right? Oh, yeah. Everything's off the table. So, hi, Ellen. I um, I help kids write their college essays, and that is um, a sort of full-time job for about six months of the year. It starts in June when students get out of school and goes through November or so when they apply to colleges. Um, and the rest of the time, I am writing three to four hours a day, three to four days a week. Um, but right now, I'm just talking about this book and partying and celebrating it and wearing clothes that match the cover. <laughs> As you should. And there have been several comments in the chat about your dress like a cover game, which is very, very strong. Would you like to tell us about your ensemble today and also where you got your dress for your launch, which had like gold coins all over? Like, thank God they didn't give you a book cover that was like chartreuse or yeah. orange. That would have been bad for my for my right. color. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the I'm actually an essay is coming out in Writer Unboxed on Saturday. Um, it's about um, nobody ever asks a writer who they're wearing. Um, but I love fashion and I am the kind of writer who really was made to go out on book tour because I love to dress up and I love to speak to a crowd. So when I saw this cover and even before, I think I sort of manifested, uh, I thought it should be blue and gold. I thought blue because of the ocean and gold because what the, what whale oil was called was liquid gold. Um, and someone was, you know, smart enough to, to figure that out and made the whale on the cover gold. Um, so with those colors in mind, I went searching on the internet and I found this dress. The, the um, designer is Solani. And the dress just sort of, I know what size I am. I can buy it in all different color combinations. And I bought it on Poshmark. It is you know, an upcycled, it's it's um, an older piece. And um, you can rent it on Rent the Runway, but I wanted to own one and I was able to find it. And I had it shortened because I'm not a tall person. And I have another version of that very same dress that I will be wearing next week to two events. And it's a lighter blue with like a flowery background. So that's one thing. And then this is Rent the Runway piece too. It's a sweater that when I saw it, I was like, this has all the colors. Is it blue? Is it purple? It's both. Um, and some other, and I kept it, oh, Captain, my captain, which is a blue and gold blazer. And if you go on Instagram, you can see me showing you these pieces. I was just about to say that, guys, if you haven't followed Julie on Instagram, Trisha will pop her info in the chat, but it is so charming she does these sort of TikTok slash instagram reels like explaining what her outfits are and why she chose them and if she's wearing them to events and um, i think it's such a great thing as the world opens back up and we go out on tour in person as well as being online in your living rooms like to have that option and, and we love we love the look julie we love it so thank you for telling us who you are wearing bringing us your basket game as well um, the cover, Dottie said, the cover is beautiful. I can't wait to read the book. I'm going to, um, and I promise I'll stop asking my own questions soon, you guys. Like, tell us about the cover a little bit. Just like, just maybe like a, a one minute thumbnail of, because this sure. is one of my favorite covers I have ever seen, I have to say. What does it convey to you? And how did you get away from not having the woman facing away from the reader looking at a ship in the distance, which is what every historical fiction author dreads and most often gets? Yeah, so I had that first. So I'll try to keep it brief. But yes, there was a woman looking off in the distance and she was like in a field. And I was like, is this Iowa? Where are we? And who is that woman on the cover? Because I don't recognize her. So we, we evolved and pushed it past that. And then they realized that three women on the cover looked busy and perhaps they should do something more graphic. And what they called it was a big book or book club, book club fiction cover and actually decided at that moment that this book could become something bigger based on what they were going to put into the artwork alone, like the um, the thinking and the um, design. So um, I love that it has this, the, you know, bold colors 
and the whale's tail. And what a friend said to me was, there's movement. Mm -hmm. it, there's action on the cover. Um, the water is moving. The water, you know, feels like that. And the women are up there on the whale's tail. So there are three women there. And then they're echoed in the ship of where the men would be. There's three sails on the men's ship. So I just love the way it does feel um, big and bold. And it also works with the title in terms of telling you who and where, mm -hmm. um, which is a com commercial fiction sort of thing. The Lost Girls of Paris, the something in that rather library, the Paris library. The, so you know who and where and you might grab it just based on that. That's such a fascinating insight into the sort of sausage making of like what goes into alchemizing a book from a manuscript into an actual book. And now from now on, if I write historical fiction, if they're gonna put a woman looking away with a dress, I'm gonna be like, oh, you don't think this is a big book? Let's have a little chat about that, shall we? And the original title for the book was A Great Fire, or The Great, the great Fire, A Great Fire. Mm -hmm. It was A Great Fire. And that's when I uh, got my agent. It was called The Great Fire. She asked me to write a prologue. And the last sentence of the prologue says, every great fire begins with a tiny spark. Now all we need is Nantucket to light the fuse, something like that. And she's like, how about a tiny spark? So we sold it with a tiny spark. But as you wisely said, you don't want tiny in, the, in your title. You want big and bold. Ooh. And then they agreed and they came back first with, as Jane Roper predicted, the whaler's wife. And that limited it to only one of our three main characters. And it also put a woman in relation to her husband, whaler's wife, um, which I did not like. And this, to be a daughter of a place feels different than a daughter of a person. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, we were happy with that. It's March, it's Women's History Month, and it felt it all felt like it was working. It, it completely works. And as somebody who is not great with titles, I loved A Great Fire, but I also love Daughters of Nantucket. And you're right, it's kind of reflective almost of what we began with, which is the baskets that get passed as lineage through the women in your family. Um, it's, it's kind of like the literary version of that. And guys, it is the greatest thing to read for Women's History Month because this is women's history. It's a woman in a non-traditional role, Mariah Mitchell. It's a black abolitionist who is Meg. It's Eliza, who is like somebody who we can all relate to, um, who's trying to carve out a place that is not totally dependent on her husband. And how did she deal with that? So also, guess what? Mother's Day is coming. So you should at least buy a copy for your mom, too. And maybe your mother-in-law, if you like her, just saying. OK, I think we have time for maybe like two audience questions. If you, if you answer fast, we can do lightning round and do three. Um, Sharon from Minnesota. Hi, Sharon. Hope you're warm today. Says, which character was your favorite? She writes. Great question. Um, I will say Eliza because she was, she's really prickly and difficult and the least like me. Um, although, you know, I am traditional. I am a wife and mother and my husband worked away. He traveled for work for a year and I understood the distance in that. But she's, you know, she's bigoted, she's she's stubborn, um, and she's kind of closed-minded to her own limitations, and I thought that made her interesting to write. Meg, easy, like very sympathetic, and everybody loves her, and Mariah was challenging because she's a true person from history, so I had to do that justice, but also have fun with her. Hmm. How do you do that? How do you balance writing the actual person with um, her entering into your historical fiction. Yeah, so there's a there's a painting of her in the library and she's looking very stern, like the librarian who yells at you if you talk in the library. And that's what I grew up knowing of her. So I had to really shake off that historical Mariah and understand that she was a woman like anybody else and she must have had secrets and desires and wants and wishes and um st i started to feel closer to her as i wrote into that and worried less about um factually what we know there's actually a gap you'll learn about in the book why there's a gap in her history we don't know what happened or what she thought that year and so i was able to make it up which was 
freeing and it is fiction after all. Mm -hmm. Good, excellent. Okay, let's have another question, please. What do you know from Anissa now that you wish you had known before starting this beautiful book? Thank you for your question. Um, I don't know, that's a good question. I think I now know, and that's what it took this book for me to understand, that I like writing heroes' journeys. That Mark, sorry, Mark is, it like, is. Oh, it is from yeah. Mark. Yeah. It is from Mark Cecil. I thank him twice in the back of the book, once really particularly for introducing to me the notion of the hero, or we should say heroine's journey, and that I like those quest stories and will continue to write them. Um, and that just gives me confidence that I can do it differently, but again. Mm -hmm. Love that, thank you. Okay, you're doing very well with the lightning round questions, I must say. Trisha, do we have another question from our audience? Audience question, how long did the book take to write? Only like 10 days, right? Yeah, just 10 days. Um, I did. I restarted doing research in the um, fall of 2018, started writing in the spring of 2019, and finished two years later, spring of 2021. Um, I think two years, I would have maybe written it that long in that amount of time anyway, but COVID really did accelerate or at least keep me from being able to do anything else except write this book. And I know other author friends were fruitful during that time too. We All we need as writers is a pandemic that doesn't kill anybody, but releases us from our obligations and also the need to wear pants. And so there you go, right? It's not a bad thing. Okay, so we're almost out of time because I've kept you for almost an hour already, but I'm going to ask a two-part question, which an interviewer should never do. And one is, can you tell us about your upcoming um, tour and where people can see you in person and get their book signed? And also, what do you want to say to your brand new audience of fans and readers? Yeah, so like I already forgot the first part of the question. Um, oh, where can you see tour. me on tour? Um, <laughs> Yeah. Go to my website, juliegerstenblatt.com. It has events and it has links to those. Um, and I update that regularly. That's the best way to find out. Like someone, a bookstore just contacted me and said, can we move your thing? So, you know, if you have it written down from last month, just check. And get, as things get closer, I will be, um, let's see, the in Inkfish Books in Warren, Rhode Island um, next Thursday. And then in Scarsdale for my New York part of the launch, Scarsdale Library on Sunday the 26th. And then um, locally also at a, an unlikely story on Wednesday the 28th of March, question mark, I think that's right. So check those out. And then tons of other things throughout the spring, I'm going to Milwaukee, I'm going to Chicago, I'm going to the suburbs of Chicago and Lake Forest. And um, I will be on Nantucket twice for Daffodil Weekend and the Nantucket Book Festival. And then again, for my own family vacation, which I think I'll probably also be doing as a book tour. Yeah, the thing is, now that you're a novelist and, and an author, you never have a vacation ever again, because anywhere you go that has a bookstore, you're like, oh, I could do an event with that bookstore. And But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so guys, if you're in the Midwest, can please check out Julia's website, no matter where you are, actually, because she is going to get around. Um, and so if you're in the Midwest, though, you can go see her in Chicago and Milwaukee, which I would certainly do. Those are great reading series as well. And the second part of the question um, and really the, the final question is, what do you have to say to your brand new audience of fans and readers? I just would say thank you. I have been so overwhelmed and delighted by everybody's response to the book. It's interesting up until Tuesday, you know, only a few people had read it. And now people are texting me to say, I read the prologue and I'm already hooked or I'm halfway through and I can't put it down. And it's just really, really beautiful to have that conversation and that relationship. And I'm looking forward to meeting more people and then joining book club discussions and getting into the nitty gritty. I was an English teacher after all, so I love a good, you know, book talk. So that's what I'm most excited about, connecting with readers. Oh my God. I, I almost made it through the interview without getting teary. So thanks a lot, Julie. 
Um, yes, and I'm sure you can contact you via your yeah, website. As my well. website, there's a form. It looks kind of like, where is this going? It go, comes right to me. I will not miss it. There's also a great Q and A that I wrote myself, like Julie, and answered um, four book clubs and book club questions, so that you can use that. And it, HarperCollins made it really nice and fancy looking. So feel free to take that to your book club and invite me because I will come either by Zoom or if I'm an hour or so away, I will try to come in person too. Amazed. You will come and bring your basket. Julie, Godspeed. I'm so proud of you. I love you. I love, love you. I'm so, okay, stop doing that. Hannah. stop it. So yes, but like, I'm so excited for you and to watch this book ascend and ascend. Everybody, you should buy at least three copies of Daughters of Nantucket right now. One for yourself, one for your mom, one for your mother-in-law, one for just like any woman you know who likes to read and any man also. Um, because it's just like top notch, so enjoyable historical fiction. And I will say, as I let you all go, please check back because it's a big spring for Blazers. Trisha's book, Trisha Blanchett, Her Herrick's Lie, will be out on March 28th. And although she won't let me do anything for her, <laughs> we're still going to be promoting it and you can buy it. Um, and also, Jane Roper who is one of our on-air hosts and producers has Society of Shame coming out April 4th. So it's going to be a partying spring, people. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to keep bringing you all the authors and all the books. And again, like especially this one so dear to my heart. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, here. Thank you everybody. Thank you for watching. Thanks for being part of The Blaze. Till next time.